Religion has not helped in fighting against unsafe abortion. That's the view of a former director general of the Ghana Health Service, Professor Ajiman Bedu Akosa. In a speech in Accra on maternal mortality and morbidity, he believes religious leaders must leave handling of health-related issues to those trained to do so. No children can hold on because either you've spoken to them or at least you've got, they've gone through school and the educational system has also informed them. Some people say if you talk to them, they will be promiscuous. All the evidence points to the contrary. That if you, you know, if you educate your children, they hold on. So why are we not doing that? Why are we allowing ignorance to dictate what our children do? 15% of pregnancies in this country are teenagers. And we know that even more than 1% are under 14. But you see, let us face it. And sometimes let's call a spade a spade. The bishops' conference. Are they saying that 385 per 100,000 live bets is all right? Did they even talk about maternal mortality? No. Why jump into family planning and abortion without talking about maternal mortality? Have they expressed any views on how to reduce maternal mortality? I challenge them. I challenge the bishops' conference that they should talk about maternal mortality and advise us how we can deal with maternal mortality. They have no business jumping into family planning and abortion. I say the chairman is my friend. I know him very well, and I know many of them. But I think that they're too quick. All the women who die, what is their view? How can we make sure that no woman dies in this country, you know, trying to give life? That, to me, should be a conference for the Catholic bishops and all the others, evangelical, non-evangelical. And let's be honest. Some of the actions are even perpetuated by some of them. <laughs> On an individual basis, whew, some of them have no problem. But collectively, they begin to talk the issue. You are muddying the waters when we have a fundamental problem to solve in this country. The Catholic Bishops' Conference says it is not against the use of contraceptives, but the methods. Speaking on Joy News Desk earlier, the president of the Catholic Bishops' uh, Conference, Most Reverend Joseph Osegons, who said they have not advised Catholics uh, not to use family planning, as alleged by pathologist Professor Jimmy Bedu Akosa. We are not against family planning. It's the method, the means that you use. And it's not just the Bishops' Conference of Ghana, but the teaching of the Catholic Church in general, that um, Catholics can practice birth control, family planning, but then they should not use artificial means. So, if you so uh, we are going for a natural means, a different method, a different method, and so on. And so we are not against family planning, we are not against birth control as such, but the means that you use. Church uh, says that uh, we should not use artificial means. So, for example, if a um, um, husband and wife, you know, they want to practice that control, they shouldn't use contraceptives. They should use uh, natural means, including the rhythm method and the method known as the filling method. And so, uh, these um, are among the means that we use. So, we shouldn't go in for artificial means. So, to simplify what you're saying, no pills, no injections, no condoms. That's right. Most Reverend Joseph Osebuns also uh, reacted to calls for the Bishops' Conference to focus attention and help reduce maternal health-related deaths. Of course, we're interested in maternal mortality. Uh, when women die, you know, I mean, that's of concern to us. And so, uh, but we are talking about um, uh, the needs of, you know, prevention. Uh, yeah. We are talking about birth control, and we are saying that uh, we should use an action. We are not talking about. Uh, you know, maternal mortality. Uh, the feelings method, for example, is very uh, safe. And then also uh, the natural means, that means uh, they're having a sex 
uh, during the uh, stay period. So these people um, work it out well, you know, it works. We also spoke earlier to Dr. Kennedy Brighton. He's the medical superintendent of the Shai Osudoku District Hospital. He said the issues of unsafe abortions is prevalent or are prevalent among rural women. A lot of women in rural Ghana and um, maybe some other places in Abang Ghana uh, resort to unsafe methods of terminating pregnancy. Unsafe methods of um, terminating pregnancy. And um, definitely that leads to death or it leads to very debilitating conditions that um, uh, women have to live with for the rest of their lives. Before you um, move on... Some damage their reproductive organs and they are not able to give birth again. What we have to know is that uh, the greater majority of the women I found out were those post JHS women, post JHS women. And we, we know that right after, after JHS, there isn't much that they want to do. And lots of them do not actually succeed in entering into secondary school and they stay around. Now, in most rural areas in this country, uh, there isn't any effective means of, of entertainment, like going to the movies or, you know. So what they engage in most often is sexual intercourse. And every sexual intercourse eventually leads to, to some pregnancy or not. Yeah. And then um, they try to terminate. And they begin to use very crude methods to terminate the pregnancy. Let's turn our attention to other matters. Making news, residents of cable and wires in Bubashi are calling on Ghana Post to give them more time to relocate to a new place before the pendant demolition exercise announced by the company yesterday. Now, Joy News' says Latifi Dries visited the community and has come through with the following report. I'm currently standing at uh, the heart of cable and wireless uh property of uh, Ghana Post, which, which has been encroached uh, by settlers who have built makeshift and permanent structures here, forming a complete community. But today, owners of the property, Ghana Post, is reclaiming the property. And how are they doing it is by demolishing all these structures you see here on this land. But for most of the residents here, this is the only place they've known as home and so are calling for more time. I have one such individual here and he's going to join me and tell me how he's taking the news of the pending demolition exercise. You're welcome to join us. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, as you are seeing, there is Metacraft Engineering Services. And all that we are asking the government to do on our behalf is to give us time for us to be able to uh, move our equipment. As we can see, we have things here of which we can move within one month or two. So at least if we can get probably a minimum of one year, it can help us to be able to do the relocation to the site. And we are working on a new site which has been given unto us, but we need time to be able to move our equipment to that. So that is what we are asking the government to do on our behalf. How would you feel if this business is closed? Hey, it will be, I mean, I don't know how to describe how I feel because this business has been my alma mater doing my education so I'm now schooling right so I do this job day in and day out when I don't have lectures I come and do the job so if the job is collapsed I don't know how to do to continue my education so if this job has been supporting me through all my education then after this far when I'm in level 300 in Legon so if this job is collapsed I don't know how to continue my education well then I'm, I'm sorry to break the news to you that there is a pending demolition exercise here. Hey, um, I don't know how to describe. It's a shock news for me right now. So I don't know how I will get fun to support myself now that a demolition exercise is going to hang up here. What, what do you do here? Uh, we produce plastic. We use the plastic waste. Then we turn it into a different product. Like the uh, bucket, chairs, we have used it and they are throwing it away. We go and take it and we recycle it. It is like a recycling center? Yeah, this is a recycling center. We recycle it, then we turn it to the new products. Have you heard about the pending demolition? 
we as it has make us make a lot of uh, difficulties for us because now we don't know other they will come today or tomorrow. So now we don't even have a stand here. Please, you know, you can see this machine. I cannot move it within one or two, one year. I have to go and get a land and they put on a structure before being all lay out and everything like this. It, one year cannot do this. We need more time. Already, we have gone to secure a land from the Bwewekwate family, which is uh, behind the Malam market. Now we have to do some preparational work on the land before we can move. We've also entered into negotiations with um, and Tetegu um, and landowners. Uh, we also have about uh, 200 acres land which we will also be preparing to move our people to. But we still need time. No, that's why the other time we went to court to seek for um, an extended injunction. Some teachers and pupils have reportedly deserted the town of Dutch Commander in the central region. This follows chief empty disputes which led to violence in which gunshots were fired. Richard Kojo Nyako is monitoring this development and joins us on the telephone. Kojo, tell us why these teachers and pupils are leaving the town. Well, um, the, this is a follow-up to the clash that happened last Saturday during the festival at Dutch Commander. And there were some skirmishes that the police gave, they intervened, and then they thought that the decision had, got, uh, had been brought under control. Then there were reprisal attacks the next day that led to some gunshots. As I speak with you now, the bullets are still in the head and neck of the people who were arrested. One has been sent to the police station hospital, and the other one has been discharged, but, got, but the bullets have not been removed from the head. The doctors say they are monitoring the situation. They have put him under medication so that um, things will turn as well for the can be removed from the head. Now, today, my visit to the community has revealed that uh, the schools have been closed down, and I ask the reason. The reason is simply that the teachers and people with their families are dressing the town because the police have started arresting people. And the teachers say, almost uh, because I spoke with, say they fear for their lives. They fear that they might also be shot like the other people that have been shot. And so that is the reason why they are calling for police intervention and assistance immediately to intervene to ensure that punishment is brought back to the community. Kojo, so what is left in the town? Or who is left in the town? Well, uh, some women, but the remaining doors, I went to their respective homes. They are unable to go to the farm. They are predominantly a uh, farming community. They also fish as well. But uh, they are unable to go to town because they fear that when they move out without their men, they are going to be attacked. So they are saying that they are dying out of hunger because they, are, they have run out of food, but they cannot also go out to, to their farm to bring some food but to their house. But Kojo, these women who uh, stayed behind, why did they not go with the others who, who fled the town? Why did they stay behind? Well, some of them, um, they flee in the night, and some of them, the women are unable to go with them. And so the town has been turned into virtually a ghost town. And those were the few women that I met in the community. Okay, and I, I bet um, the town has been brought to a, st a standstill in terms of business. Is there any activity at all happening? Well, um, occasionally the police go there, and when they suspect anything, then they go and inspect the arrest. But sadly, the police have not been able to speak to the media. They say that they will not speak to the media until they are done with everything they want to do. We, we, we have tried practically to speak with the, uh, the president of the National House of Chiefs that uh, of the regional house of Chiefs that you are able to get. What, what about other local authorities? The assembly? Well, lo local, the local authorities, I spoke with the MP and he said that he is head to the place to study the situation because he is the head of the city in the KEA of the city. Okay, Kojo, we'll leave it here. Definitely touch base uh, in subsequent bulletins. That's Richard Kojo Nyako from the central region. Now, the couple who burns the fingers of a two-year-old boy in the Ashanti region has been remanded.
into prison custody to reappear on October 6, 2015. Judge Peter Opong Bohene remanded Nana Oti and Rita Oti, caretakers of the boy, to allow the prosecution more time to investigate the matter. The two are accused of burning the fingers of two year old of a two year old with a red hot iron. Love FM's arrest as a Sari Donko reported the couple, particularly the woman, showed no sign of remorse when they were remanded on Thursday. According to a neighbor, the two were expected to be guardians of a boy whose father is domiciled in Nigeria, but they turned out to uh, be chronic molesters of the little one. Accusing the victim of eating out, the two conspired to burn the fingers of the two-year-old boy who is now at the Confa Noche teaching hospital. The victim was thought to have lost only two of the fingers by, by Joy FM's uh, Super Morning show host, Kojo Yangsen, who traveled to Kumasi to pay him a visit, said all five fingers have been lost. Kojo Yangsen spoke to the surgeon in charge of the boy's case. I think um, in terms of course, just flipping through the, the bills that have been listed um, so far, um, we're going to an average of about 3,800 Ghana cities from the surgical calls and then from the emergency. But let me quickly add that the medications and the period spent on the ward will have to be added up by the accounts department. So I, I won't be able to tell you exactly what it is until the patient is discharged. So it will be no less than 3,000? Most certainly, yeah. So far? So far, yeah. But are there likely to be future costs in the continued treatment of this child? Oh, certainly. Like I said earlier, this is a patient who is going to need support. I mean, psychologically, socially, and this is a child that if he's going to be of use to himself or to herself and then for the future, he has to be very well educated, for instance. So the child education is very, very key. Because for somebody whose hand is not going to be so functional at this, at this age, I mean, what it means is that you have to be developed intellectually very well. And then in the long term, this child is also going to require uh, a very good prosthesis. And these prostheses are actually varied. I mean, if you want to get a very superior prosthesis that will function for the child in terms of um, maybe for driving, in terms of even for, for his vocation, we are not too sure what it's going to be for the future. But if he gets into a vocation that is going to require both hands, then you need a very superior prosthesis that can really function like the natural hand. Mm -hmm. So are you able to throw out a ballpark figure? Of ah, uh, that would be, very, that'd be very difficult. That would be very important. Those ones come in very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In terms of what is worse, um, for the extent of damage, the fact that the tissues were deeply bent, and the fact that it was um, becoming necrotic, I mean, in common man's language, it was dying. I mean, the patient could have developed what we call septicemia. In this case, we could have had infection that was spread throughout the whole body, and the patient could have died from uh, um, generalized infection in the body. According to the doctor, the three remaining fingers had to be cut off because uh, they were in a complete state of deterioration. A strong willed boy, as Yangsen described him, naturally succumbed to the pain as he moaned and groaned for the most part of the time Kojo Yangsen was there. Is he in a lot of pain? Yeah, as you can see. So tell me, since the surgery, how has he been? After the surgery, he has been okay, but there is a little bit of pain. Because after the surgery, you might suspect some pain. But he's been on some pain medication and analgesis, so I think we are trying to manage the pain. How long do you think it will take for such an injury to heal? It depends. It depends. And once he's a child, yeah, it will heal, but it will take some time. Are we looking at months or weeks or years? Months. Yeah, months. And after the surgery, we've not opened the wound. The wound has not yet been opened. So now I can't even tell you the state of the wound right now because he went to theater on the 28th. So we are yet to open the wound. Is this a unique case or do you see many cases like this? Ward? For Benz, it's no unique case on my ward. For Benz, by the history, it's, it's no unique case. He's been having bends over the years, these months. His case is not a unique case. That is his history, the history he presented on admission.
so he's a two year old he's not yet speaking properly but he's very able to communicate his feelings he's an adorable little child he, he's so beautiful and it's difficult to imagine how an adult can look at such a, a, a wonderful boy and harm him deliberately And our prayers are with this little boy. You're watching Joy News today with me, Francisca Kakrafos. So let's take a break. We'll bring you more when we return. Welcome back to Joy News today. The debate on whether it was right for the local government ministry to release equipment procured for the district assembly elect, uh, assemblies to be used in the dredging of the Odor uh, drain continues. The MPP MP for uh, Chim Swedru Kennedy Nyakose insists the move was an illegality and engineers and planners must be made to pay the full cost of the equipment. Government through the Ministry of Local Government released such equipment which were meant for the assembly. But don't forget, those equipment were made to, because at the committee level, there were several questions that were asked as to who were going to pay for those equipment. We were made to understand that those assemblies were going to pay for the equipment through their district common fund. So if you say you are going to give Assembly A XY number of equipment, brand new, not used one, which you do a deduction for the little share of the fund. You mean their share of the fund? Yes, right? you what? are even going to start what is, them. What is the adjective little for? Uh, well, uh, you can, can, I mean, little in the sense that uh, when it goes, they it, can't even use it to do any meaningful developmental project. So that is little. Hmm. You are going to start them from such funds because you have promised to give them alternatives so that they can use to develop the area. Now you let. A private company go and use the equipment without even the knowledge of the assembly that you procured the equipment for. And we said, no, we think it is illegal. So if government have such intention of using that equipment, we have no problem with that. But we will have every problem if government at the end want to send those old or used equipment to the assembly. We will not agree. Because of you have made a request for a new equipment, not used equipment. So government can take responsibility now. Take those equipment, say that we are taking it. We want to procure a new one and send it to the assembly. We will have no problem. But we have every problem if government decide that after the usage of this equipment by engineers and planners, they want to send same equipment to the assembly. But is it not the understanding that the equipment were used within a period of an emergency? Uh, we had uh, a number of um, actions that need to be um, completed because we had an emergency. Um, there was a flood period, and so the equipment were used uh, for the odor or the quality, so it depends on which part of the water body that uh, engineers and planners were working for. I, I don't see the tail of the tail and head of this argument. You see, if government, yes, it was an emergency. Government have access to some of this equipment. When you go to national security and, and see. But MP for Ablekuma Central Theophilus Tete Chai insists it was necessary to use the equipment because we were in a state, a state of emergency and that does not change anything. We are getting closer to elections and uh, I believe that uh, some of these things are normal. So you're saying this, the, the press conference was just politics? Oh yes, I believe, uh, yeah, these things are normal. But you see, it is the government that uh, has oversight responsibility as to how the district uh, assemblies common fund are disbursed. Even if some of the equipment that were supposed to be used by other districts were channeled into this project, government has a way of uh, giving back those uh, 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 assemblies what they are due without uh, uh, necessarily sending old equipment 
to those areas. What's your argument? That the equipment are not old? No. They've been used. Exactly. They've been used. They've been used for purposes for which they were not procured yeah. for. Exactly. That's a concern but of the But that minority. is a, na a national disaster. More so, they've been, used, they've been used by the president's brother's country. You see, when you have a, 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 a natural disaster, it's something that you, you've not planned for. And you need to be on top of it. Okay? Assuming government decided that, look, we don't have the equipment. So we're going to be there. Uh, these machines that we procured, they are for certain district assemblies. So let's wait. When we get our equipment, we'll come and drain the drains. It doesn't make sense. Okay? So at the spare of the moment, what you have, you need to use it. Just behind you, you can see um, the chief executive of uh, engineers and planners removing stickers. Um, those are his branded stickers on those vehicles. They were not for him. No, not necessarily yeah, personally. Yeah, yeah. They were not for his company yeah. or they were not for engineers and yeah, planners. Yeah, yeah. Why did we need to brand them? Well, they were carrying out the project. And we, 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 we queried that. And they, they took it off. Chief Justice Georgina Theodora Wood has cautioned judges and lawyers that no dishonorable member of the profession will enjoy immunity from the legal counsel. She maintains the judicial counsel will not preside over decay, adding that members of the legal profession must do an introspection to find ways of winning back public confidence following allegations of bribery and corruption that has rocked the country's judiciary. She was speaking at the 2015 enrollment of new lawyers. Felix Aquiam joins me in the studio. He's just come from there. So, Felix, what did the CJ say about sanitizing the judiciary? Yeah, um, Francisca, the CJ has been saying that, I mean, this judiciary, I mean, bribery scandal that has rocked the, judici um, the judiciary, of course, has sunk, you know, public confidence in the judiciary. And she's just, you know, admonishing lawyers and, you know, judges in general to live beyond reproach. She's saying that there is no way the legal counsel is going to shield any member of the legal fraternity who engage in bribery or corruption. And I mean, it's important for them to do all they can, they can to find ways of winning back the winning public confidence in the judiciary. Now, the event was about new lawyers being called to the bar, and there's an interesting uh, individual among them, that's the Deputy uh, Labor Relations Minister, Baba Jamal. Absolutely. Um, congratulations, congratulations to him. Congratulations to him. I mean, 219 um, new lawyers have been inducted today, and he is part of them. And I mean, for him, it's an interesting day, um, I mean, day for him, because becoming a lawyer has been a long time dream for him. and. I mean, even judging from the fact that this is also a very challenging moment for the judiciary in general, he's saying that it's a moment that inspires him to, you know, try and also stand up for the rise of, you know, um, the weak and the vulnerable in society in general, Franca. Okay, so congratulations to him and his other colleagues. Thank you very much, Thank you. Felix. Let's take a quick break right now. Let's do business now. Cocoa farmers will, by uh, today, know how much the state will offer them for each ton and a 64-kilo bag of cocoa beans. Government is expected to open negotiations with the farmers this morning, hoping that the meeting will end with farmers accepting what they will offer to them. We'll be joined on the telephone lines by John Amwakon, who is at the anticipated program. John, so what are the expectations? Well, thank you very much. Actually, the expectation is that um, cocoa prices will actually be increased because uh, looking at both international and domestic market conditions, what is, I mean, what analysts are saying is that well, moving forward, we're going to see some decline in the commodity, uh, the volume of commodity that we supply in the market, and in fact, demand of that particular commodity would increase, thereby actually forcing price to go up. So we all gather, we are all gathered here at the Ministry of Finance, waiting for the minister to actually um, announce the price. But almost all over, everybody's actually expecting an upward adjustment of the commodity. 
Okay, John, we'll leave it here and allow you to be able to monitor the event when it starts. But that's uh, John Amoakon of Joy Business. Now, there appears to be some questions about whether government was able to raise the $1.5 billion uh, during the Eurobond Roadshow. A statement from the Finance Ministry only gave an indication that the exercise ended on September 30, but silent on the amount raised. Now, the, chief, the outgoing group chief executive of Ecobank, Albert Asian, says the speculations are unnecessary and adds that he supports government's decision to restrict the Eurobond issue to favorable market conditions. I mean, you have to uh, launch the bond at within a uh, good which includes pricing. So I'm sure the government wants to make sure that they get the best out of the fundraising. So do we get an indication that there's a brief hold or what? No, the statement doesn't state so. The statement said they're still considering it and they'll do it under favorable conditions. Don't you think that there's still some level of uncertainty which is not good for the market and even good for our economy? The statement doesn't say that there's level of uncertainty. I don't think we should read meanings into the statement. It might be right that it was targeted for a certain date, but these things do happen. If the conditions are not favorable, you don't need to get yourself into it. So the government is looking for the best possible conditions. And I do agree that they should look for the best possible conditions. So the local rice, apart from its nutritional values, is far more healthier than the foreign imported ones. That's according to a Greek minister, Fifi Kwete, speaking with Joint Business. He reiterated the need to uh, be proud of what we produce locally. In terms of importation uh, into the country, I mean, rice has been gulping almost in a region of about $400 million. At a point, even beyond that, it was half a billion dollars. That tells you a huge, huge, huge amount of money we are spending importing rice. Now, it's different if we did not have the capacity to produce the same type of rice. Now we do. So it means instead of using that amount of money to import rice into the country, we should rather use that to spare our farmers that actually are ready to be able to grow the same rice for us. And that becomes transformational if you can do that switch. Because some of the rice you are bringing from, from our Abroad, have been in warehouses sometimes for two years, and you consume food that has actually been grown two, three years, and you think you are actually I mean, consuming quality. That actually is creating a health even problems for our own people. So we need to, especially you, the media, need to help us to change the whole mind, mindset of our people to appreciate that what we have now is top quality, is healthy, is nutritious. That's it for business. Sports is next. Still here on news today. My name is Benedict. So let's talk sports now. And another shock in the Ghana Football Association's executive committee elections as Abdullah Al Hassan has been elected Northern Regional Football Association chairman after beating incumbent Adam Munkaila at the elections some few hours ago. Now at the end of voting, Abdullah pulled uh, Al Hassan pulled uh, 49 votes while Adam Munkaila had 30 out of the total votes cast. Al Hassan will therefore represent the region on the next uh, national executive committee of the Ghana Football Association. Now let's go live and speak to our regional correspondent that's El Samuels who is still at the election ground. So El, uh, what, what has he been telling you? Probably he must be a happy man, 28 year old man, beating Adam Munkaila who has been in office for uh, the past 20 years. Yes, Adam has been in office since 1994 as we speak to date until today he met as much. But a young man believes that uh, he has to take over the mantle from the man who has been running affairs for all those years. And it's a, it's, a, it's a story that a lot of uh, delegates who voted for uh, the young man are so excited about it because everybody is calling for a change. They believe that this is a time for a change to emerge. And that is why they voted massively for him. 19 a vote difference between the two. Adam had 40, uh, 30 as against 49 for uh, Abu Imoro. You remember most people believe that Abu has done so much well that he's been able to set up an academy here, a youth check academy here in the northern sector. And that alone speaks for him. And he believes that there's a lot he can do. And Adam believes that he could use his incumbency to have won. But this time around, the delegates uh, say a uh, no to it. One of the delegates I have here will tell you the reason why they decided to change 
Adam. Uh, Adam Mukaila lost the election to Abdullah Muru. Young man, the vision of the North, is a person who has the people at heart, listen to transform the football in the region. He has a lot of potential in him, and as far as the academy is concerned, it's good in football. And um, Abdullah Muru went all this long journey, and today he has seen that the dinner comes to an end. Imagine him as a winner because through his well, interaction with others and other sports at Kedesha, uh, we have seen that he had the zeal to promote football in the region. We are lacking behind as a region in football. Why? Because administration at the top is very poor. And Adai Moro is coming out to promote football in the region. We have seen some things that has been contested for the food. Give a share of football. So, you know, that was our original correspondent, El Samuels, in that interview with one of the delegates there. Alassan Abdullah is now the uh, RFA chairman for the Northern uh, Regional Football Association. Well, some surprises coming in uh, just two days ago. It was about Fred Krentel, uh, Kujufian all losing out, and now uh, Adam Monkaila. We can do some more here. And the FIFA Club Licensing Regulation rolled out in 2006 is the basic working document for confederations and number of associations. Now, it enjoins clubs to incorporate minimum requirements and guidelines in their operations to be more professional and is to also be implemented in five thematic areas, namely the legal, financial, infrastructure, and sporting administrative criteria. Now, these regulations, according to the Ghana Football Association President Christina Tichi, were to be fully implemented at the end of this season. We are more than 60% through Ghana, is a shining star. But it has not been easy at all, even in Asia. Uh, and many other African countries, they haven't gone much. Ghana is a shining star. Ghana, Algeria, and South Africa are the, the leading countries on the implementation of the club licensing. There are even countries in Africa that have not done regulations yet on club licensing. We have. Um, then, do we have a time frame within which we would want to say that, okay, within this time, we want to get to about 90% of um, implementing all the club licenses in... Yeah, 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 this is the time. The Congress of the Ghana Football Association approved a timetable for, or, or, yeah, a timetable for the implementation of the club licensing. We had a separate timetable for Premier Division clubs and uh, another one for the First Division class. We have done that and this season we are supposed to comply fully with all the five teams of the club licensing and I think we are on course. Okay, so by the end of the season, be fully for Premier. So that was Football Association President Christina Tiji. But as it stands now, almost all the Premier League uh, teams fall short of the five thematic requirements of the club licensing regulations. Now, according to Executive Committee member of the GFA, Georgie Free, the setback is fully attributed to the lack of funds. The Liberty Professionals Chief believes if clubs do not get any financial backing anytime soon, then it will be very difficult to implement it. It's money. If you ask me to be very candid and to be very honest with you, it's all about the finances. Look, if you want a club like Liberty Professionals to have a training facility aside the training field, it requires a lot of money. You need not less than $200,000 to put a new training facility in place. Do we have that finances? We don't. And so that is why I'm saying that maybe very soon you see clubs merging. You see club coming together to form partners and all that because in order to meet fully the requirements of club licensing, then I think that clubs need to consider coming, coming together to match. And that's it for sports. Enjoy the rest of the program. Well, just before we go, let me tell you about Bukom Banku. He has a case in court, and it appears he's not very happy with the trial, but he's got some message uh, for the judges. No go government to forget the judges, because everybody do mistake. You understand it? Everybody do mistake in the nation. Well, when the judges are do mistake, let's do this, because it's our Ghanaian judges. Don't disgrace the judges. I want to tell all the Ghanaians to forget this issue because eh, they want to kill their judges or what? They talk their matter. Eh, it's not fine. It's our judges. If somebody do wrong things, 
let's forget. I want to tell all the Ghanaians or the government that they forget everything to leave our judges matter for them. Everybody, you they work, you do mistake. You know, when judges do mistake, let's forgive us. Yeah, tomorrow is another day. When the God cook, there is no smoke. And the God that created the world before the born Jesus Christ. Well, leave the judges, Ghanaians. I beg you. We are all one. Oh. It's a Ghanaians. Oh, me, my, my, I talk my sensibility. So that's Bukum Banku. Forget the judges' uh, trial, but you can go to myjournalline.com for more news. Thank you very much for your company. I'm Francisca Takwa for Bye bye.